many molecules um, exist in sharing electrons with um, other atoms, uh, achieving an octet in the valence shell. That being said, there's a, exceptions to the octet rule all over the place. But <clears throat> literally millions of compounds, we follow the octet rule and we can draw Lewis dot structures for them if for some reason we wanted to. Lewis dot structures historically have been around a long time. They were before we learned about um, the uh, electron configuration um, of electrons and atoms and, and, and ions. And the um, chapter that we were exposed to that uh, involved um, uh, the physics, you know, of the 20th century and the use of Schrodinger wave equations is really where we came up with the uh, electron orbitals in atoms. So obviously, Lewis dot structures are older, they're, uh, I don't want to say more primitive, but they're just a simple little bookkeeping skill that chemists use to justify why certain molecules are formed based on the number of their ele uh, valence electrons and that they're, and they're bonding to uh, <coughs> give <coughs> atoms an octet in the valence shell similar to a noble gas. So uh, the electron configurations came along later than that and then after um, it was understood somewhat the electrons, the regions of space, the orbitals that they occupied in the most stable state of atoms and ions then the question became, um, how do these electrons and these atomic orbitals give rise to molecules? I mean, Lewis dot structures don't give us any information on the three-dimensional shape of a molecule. They don't give us any information on the shape of orbitals. And so really, it's, uh, it's the notion of how atomic orbitals, if you have an atom of an element, how do they proceed uh, to make molecules in what we call molecular orbitals? When we figure out the Lewis, um, I'm sorry, the electron configuration of an atom of an element, well, how many elements exist as just single elements in nature? Very few. So there's something that happens to these atomic orbitals when molecules are formed, and molecules are more stable than the free atoms, or they wouldn't exist. And there's three levels of, or three theories related to this chapter. Uh, one is uh, one theory which has to do with the three-dimensional shape of molecules and this is valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. And although the name is busy or long, the concept is really quite straightforward. Uh, the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory um, simply addresses the shapes of molecules as, as being a consequence of electrons repelling each other, whether these electrons are in a covalent bond or in a non-bonded pair, they all have negative charges and so they want to repel each other and get as far apart as possible within the molecule. And the simplest way of addressing that, or the simplest example of that, if you're into uh, playing with party balloons, if you have some kind of a molecule that has a central atom and two pairs of electrons in covalent bonds, and it doesn't have any non-bonded pairs, now that type of molecule wouldn't satisfy the octet rule but there are molecules that do that. You tie two balloons together and the structure is linear, right? If you tie two, well, you, you blow off the balloons first and then you tie them together, you got a linear shape. 
if you have a central atom that forms three covalent bonds and doesn't have any non-bonded pairs, now it would only have six electrons in its valence shell, so it wouldn't satisfy the octet rule, and there's exceptions to the octet rule. But the shape is easy to predict. If you tie three balloons together, they're going to point to the corners of a triangle. Okay? And electrons kind of do the same thing. They're repelling each other, trying to get as far apart as possible. If you have a molecule like methane, where there's a carbon bonded to four atoms, hydrogen in the example of methane, well, if you tie four balloons together, they're going to point to the corners of a, uh, corners of a tetrahedron structure. Again, the electrons are trying to get as far apart as possible, and that's really the basis of this. And it's not just the electrons that are in covalent bonds, but also the pairs of electrons that are in orbitals that aren't bonded to anything. Next, we have this um, concept of bonding that we call uh, valence bond theory. And this uh, literally uh, looks at how the atomic orbitals, when they form molecules, they, end they undergo what chemists call um, hybridization. And so they, and they involve a hybridization of atomic orbitals. And if you, um, if you ever took biology, you might have a, a plant that has, produces both white and red flowers. And if you cross-pollinate them, you end up with a hybrid flower that's pink, perhaps. Or if, you know, two animals that have characteristics, their offspring might be a hybrid of the two. Well, this is the notion in a valence bond theory is that the atomic orbitals that we learned about when we learned the electron configuration of atoms, when they're in, involved in molecule formation, they hybridize. And we're going to look at examples of that hybridization. They're hybridizing to ultimately form molecular orbitals. And then the third theory, uh, there's actually some problems with valence bond theory um, that uh, break down and uh, partly because of those problems that are encountered in explaining why certain molecules exist. There's another theory, and we're just going to kind of look at the tip of the iceberg, but the other theory is molecular orbital theory. Uh, this is the third of these theories, if you will, that's discussed in this chapter. And a molecular orbital theory, just like we were talking about hydrization of atomic orbitals, but we're looking at very simple examples when we talk about molecular orbital theory. We're going to have two atoms, and we know the electron configuration of each atom, and we bring them together, and they will form molecular orbitals, and the number of molecular orbitals is exactly the same as the number of atomic orbitals <coughs> individual atoms have. And we have a very simple equation that enables us to predict when we bring these two atoms together, do they form a bond? Are they stable? Or not? And we already know in advance some simple atoms that should, molecular orbital theory, should predict that are stable because we know if we bring two hydrogen atoms together, they do form a stable molecule and its formula is H2. When we bring two nitrogen atoms together, they do form a stable molecule. Its formula is N2. When we bring two oxygen atoms together, he, they do form a stable molecule, O2. But if we bring something like <clears throat> two heliums together, we don't get a stable molecule. And so helium exists as individual atoms. 
So that's a third of these three theory, uh, theories, excuse me, that we got to look at in this chapter. And usually they're separated into two chapters, but this particular textbook combined them. Okay? So um, let's go ahead and take a look. Oh, what's this thing doing? Now, uh, next time we want to start, well, we might look at a couple of these practice problems today because we did finish chapter 9. Uh, but um, let's go ahead and get started looking at uh, chapter 10, where these three uh, theories are introduced. Anyone know what this uh, soccer ball is here? It's actually discovered by a chemist in Texas. That's Buckminster Fulverine. <laughs> and it's a molecule that's shaped like a soccer ball made of carbon. And it, uh, a professor at Rice University in Houston got the Nobel Prize for uh, discovering it and determining its structure. One place that Buckminster Fulverine is, is sometimes generated is uh, when you're barbecuing. So if you put away barbecue meat like I do, I've probably eaten a lot of Buckminster Fulverine. But it's just one form of carbon that hadn't been discovered. They already knew about diamond and graphite, but this is another. Anyway, it's got an interesting geometry. All right, now we're going to talk. Start off then with Veeman shell electron pair repulsion theory, and um, this predicts the geometry of a molecule from the electrostatic repulsions between the electrons, bonding and non-bonding pairs. And here it shows you, in, in a generalized way, the simplest scenario. Um, would be a molecule of the class AB2, where A is the central atom, and it's bonded to two Bs, and there's no non-bonded pairs. Now again, any kind of molecule or ion like this is going to be an exception to the octet rule. Because you see here the central atom A, whatever this is, has two covalent bonds, and that's four electrons, but it doesn't have any non-bonded pairs. So this is not common, but it does occur um, for the uh, element of beryllium, for example. If you have your periodic table, you might want to kind of take a peek. But beryllium on the periodic table is <clears throat> an element that doesn't obey the octet rule when it forms molecules. And uh, beryllium has... Um, two valence electrons. It forms two covalent bonds, but there's no non-bonded pairs. Well, so all the electrons you have are the two in each of these covalent bonds. They repel each other, and they generate a shape that's linear. These electrons, they don't want to be right next to each other. So beryllium is not going to have a shape like this, where the coins are kissing each other because these, the negative charge in these um, covalent bonds is repelling each other. And the way to get as far apart as possible for this arrangement is um, <clears throat> linear. And so this is, and they, you know, they verify these things. They do X-ray crystal holography and other studies to show that the molecules really are this shape. Okay. So that's a simple example. Now, if you have AB3, um, you have a central atom that's bonded to three other atoms, or groups of atoms, and it doesn't have any non-bonded pairs. Now, that also wouldn't satisfy the octet rule, but again, such molecules do exist. And an uh, example of that would be, well, I'm not showing you, 
uh, the central atom, an, an atom that does this is boron. And if I just pick a molecule for an example here, uh, <clears throat> uh, for the first scenario, we had uh, beryllium uh, chloride was linear. And sometimes, in, if you're brought, drawing loose dot structures, sometimes chemists just draw lines instead of pairs to save time. But the important thing is it's linear, and the bond angle here is 180 uh, degrees. And that's, that gets these electrons as far apart as possible, just like if you tie two balloons together. With boron, if you have a compound like um, boron trifluoride, and we won't even worry about the other electrons. Well, this is not exactly, we're not really talking about most out structures today anyway. We're talking about the shape of the molecule. And you can see you've got kind of a trigonal system here, and it's planar. The bond angle here is going to be 120 degrees and to get these as far apart as possible. Okay? I mean, these could be more than 120, but then they'd be too close to this one, and so on. And it's just, again, it's just like if, if you tie three balloons together, that's the shape they're going to assume to get as far apart as possible. Well, tetrahedral, um, you can have tetrahedral geometry either for a central atom like carbon that has four covalent bonds, or if you're looking at the electrons, you can also have other nonmetals that have lone pairs in addition to covalent bonds, um, and we'll take a look at that. But tetrahedral geometry, example of this, of course, would be um, methane. Uh, and methane, and here's its geometry, 109.5. This is the structure you get so it's if you tied four balloons together. Historically, uh, you know, there was a time when they didn't know what the structure of methane was in three dimensions. I mean, even when they determined that its molecular formula was CH4, they didn't know it could have, these hydrogens could have been down here like legs on a fire ant or something. I mean, they didn't know what its three dimensional structure was. But then there's experiments that suggested that the structure was tetrahedral, and then it was confirmed by X-ray diffraction and other studies years later. But the, the, a way to get the four covalent bonds as far apart as possible, okay, when you have a central atom that has four bonds to other atoms and no non-bonded pairs, they point to the corners of a tetrahedron, and that's the geometry of methane, for example. And if these atoms or groups of atoms are all identical, then your bond angle is 109.5 degrees. Okay? And that's going to get them farther apart. <laughs> Let's say somebody thought that methane was flat. Well, the, the covalent bonds aren't as far apart if it's flat, is it? This is 90 degrees. So this is greater than 90. They're farther apart in three dimensions when they point to the corners of a tetrahedron. So that's a classic example of a central atom that has four single bonds to other atoms and no lone pairs. Well, here we go. <laughs> it's an interesting, uh, we talk so much about the octet rule, and we can use the octet rule for millions of molecules, but there's exceptions in the other direction. Here, if you have a central atom that has five um, bonds, the structure that results is called a trigonal bipyramidal. And uh, we'll see examples of that later. If you have a central atom that has six bonds and no lone pairs, it's octahedral. Okay? 
Well, now this is a kind of a handy uh, guide here because it actually shows examples. A central atom with two bonds and no lone pairs is linear, like beryllium dichloride, uh, mercury chloride. That's mercury two chloride. Um, here, an example of a trigonal planar system is boron trifluoride. Notice that it, you can use it for ions as well as molecules. Tetrahedral, an example is methane, we put that on the board. And also the polyatomic cation ammonium is going to be tetrahedral geometry also. There's a nitrogen with four hydrogens pointing to the corners of a tetrahedral, but based on the formal charge that we talked about in the last chapter, the nitrogen, when it has four bonds instead of three, has a positive charge, and so the entire ion has a positive charge, and it's going to have a tetrahedral geometry. Here's an exception to the octet rule involving uh, phosphorus. Phosphorus and sulfur for, can expand their valence shell. Here is phosphorus pentachloride, and it's got a central phosphorus bonded to five chlorines. Its structure is trigonal bipyramidal, and sulfur can expand its valence shell. Uh, here, instead of eight, it's going to have 12 electrons around it. Sulfur hexafluoride, its structure is octahedral. Now, this kind of thing I'm going to probably print out and give you a copy of, it and it'll be on the exam. Well, now, um, what about if you have um, non bonded pairs? What happens then? All the examples we looked at before involved covalent bonds only. There was none that had an orbital with a pair of electrons in it that wasn't bonded to anything. So here, now here's the easiest example of that scenario. We're going to look at methane, the gas, ammonia, and water. In methane, we already saw it's got four covalent bonds and the carbon doesn't have any lone pairs or non-bonded pairs of electrons. And so these four covalent bonds point to the corners of a tetrahedron. End of story. But when you move on to ammonia, ammonia actually has three hydrogens covalently bonded to the nitrogen and then there's a pair of electrons in an orbital that's not bonded to anything. Now this is ammonia, the molecule, not ammonium ion that we saw before. Well, electrons that are not bonded to anything are still going to repel electrons, if not more so than electrons that are bonded to an atom. So we talk, when we have a molecule like this that has both covalent bonds in it and not one non-bonded pair in it, there's two things that we consider. The electronic geometry and the molecular geometry. The electronic geometry, there's a pair of electrons here that's non-bonded pair that's not bonded to anything. And then there's three pairs of electrons in these covalent bonds. If you look at all the electron pairs, you have a tetrahedron, don't you? But if you ignore the non-bonded pair and just look at the atoms, I'm trying to do that. If you just look at the atoms and not the non-bonded pair, we have a name for this structural structure here of just the molecules atoms. And that's um, trigonal pyramidal. 
so to review what we just said, with methane, since it doesn't have any non-bonded pairs of electrons, its electronic geometry and its molecular geometry are the same. Tetrahedral. But now, with ammonia, we have a non-bonded pair of electrons and three covalent bonds. Its electronic geometry is tetrahedral. But if you just look at the green, its molecular geometry is trigonal pyramidal. Same thing with water. It's got two non-bonded pairs and two bonds to hydrogen. If you look at the non-bonded pairs and the two covalent bonds, again, it's tetrahedral. That's the electronic geometry. But if you ignore these non-bonded pairs and you just look at the atoms, does anybody remember what we call the structure of water? That's a real scientific term. It's bent. That's the structure bent. Think of hook them horns. Bent. Right here. If you look just at the oxygen, the hydrogen, and the hydrogen here, the molecule is bent. But if you include the electron pairs, the electronic geometry is tetrahedral. Does everyone see the difference between the electronic geometry and the molecular geometry? Any question about that? The electronic geometry and the uh, molecular geometry are only going to be different if there's any non-bonded pairs. Methane doesn't have any non-bonded pairs of electrons, so its electronic and molecular geometry are the same. Tetrahedral. Okay? Now, one thing, because these non-bonded pairs aren't bonded to anything, they actually have a full negative two charge, and it's not diluted at all by the nucleus of the atom they're bonded to, per se. And so, notice that it kind of puckers these things, kind of like an umbrella backwards in the wind might get, if the wind blows harder, it might pucker them. And methane, all the bonds are the same. And so, any two bonds you pick, the bond angle is 109.5. But with ammonia, that negative two charge in that orbital shoves these electron pairs in these bonds down a little bit. And so it's only 107.3. It's still overall tetrahedron, but it's been warped a little bit. Oxygen has two pairs of electrons repelling these bonds, and so it puckers even more. And you got 104.5 degrees. Again, with methane, all these bond angles are exactly the same because all four involve hydrogen bonded to carbon. But in ammonia and water, these non-bonded pairs, even though the electronic structure is tetrahedral, it does shove these covalent bonds together a little bit because of the full negative two charge in these non-bonded pairs. Does everybody see that? Mm -hmm. To review, for methane, the electronic and the micro geometry are the same. But since ammonia has a non-bonded pair and water has two non-bonded pairs, the electronic and molecular geometries are different. All three of these, the electronic geometry is tetrahedral, but the molecule methane is tetrahedral. Just the molecule, the atoms of ammonia are trigonal pyramidal, and the, mo and the atoms of the molecule of water are bent. Okay? Well, so now we have to put in some new scenarios, don't we? If we have, <clears throat> we said before, if there's three, uh, covalent bonds and no pairs, it's trigonal planar. And so is the molecule. But if you have an electron pair, AB2E, E stands for an electron pair, 
an example would be sulfur dioxide. Well, the electronic geometry is in this column. It's trigonal planar, but the structure of the molecule for sulfur dioxide is banned. Don't forget, since there's a non-bonded pair, this and the electronic geometry and the molecular geometry is not the same. Now these, again, these, these slides like this one here, also I'm going to give you a printout of these. But it's going to get more complicated, isn't it? We saw methane was, uh, it has a carbon bonded to four hydrogens, tetrahedral and tetrahedral. Then with ammonia, there's three covalent bonds and a lone pair. The electronic arrangement's tetrahedral, but the molecular geometry is actually if you look just at the atoms, that's trigonal pyramidal. We saw water. It has two electron pairs plus two atoms that are bonded to the central atom. Again, the ele electron geometry is tetrahedral, but the molecular geometry of the molecule, if we ignore these two pairs of electrons, is called band. Okay. Well, this goes on, and again, these are exceptions to the octet rule. Um, if you have five atoms bonded to a central atom and no lone pairs, we said it's trigonal bipyramidal. But if there's one electron pair, then even though the electronic geometry is trigonal bipyramidal, the actual molecule is called distorted tetrahedron here. Um, here we've got um, two electron pairs, and um, I gotta chase down that generator. I'm not that way. Um, I'll be right back. But again, this I'm going to give you this as a handout in these slides because uh, they're a good guide. Uh, there's a Thank you so much. And they and discovered either molecules and or ions that satisfy all of these interesting geometries. And again, many of these geometries that we're talking about don't satisfy the octet rule. Here, this carbon trifluoride, it's got two electron pairs and three bonds uh, to uh, fluorines. Um, the electronic geometry is trigonal bipyramidal, but the actual molecule is called T-shaped, and it's right here. It's just this part. Okay. Here uh, you've got um, two bonds to a central atom and three non-bonded pairs, um, and um, you're going to have the electronic geometry that's trigonal bipyramidal, but the actual molecule is linear, and this is uh, like the ion triiodide, which actually exists if you have iodide, I minus, in a solution that has iodine, I2. They form this complex, I3 minus, and it has, actually has this geometry. And of course, the central iodide is definitely not obeying the octet rule, is it? because it has um, um, five pairs of electrons around it. <clears throat> um, so uh, this is kind of pointing out that even though exceptions to the octet rule don't make up a large percentage of the compounds and ions we've discovered, we have discovered compounds and ions that have all these variety of shapes. Here we have a, a, a molecule with a central atom that's bonded to five other species and has one non-bonded pair. The electronic geometry is octahedral, but if there's a pair of electrons here, this geometry of these atoms is called square pyramidal. Um, I told you noble gases don't generally form 
compounds. In nature, they don't. But we have made some xenon derivatives in the lab. And here is one. And we don't expect xenon to bond to anything. It's got a full octet. So it's obviously an exception to the octet rule. But here we have an interesting scenario where the central atom xenon in this example is bonded to four atoms and has two pairs of electrons. And um, it's octahedral in the electronic geometry, but the actual molecule is square planar. And then the two non-bonded uh, pairs of electrons are above and below the plane of the square. I have no idea what kind of torturous conditions they have to expose xenon to to make compounds like that. But and so here, this would probably be a good one here. This, this one summarizes um, what we've been saying here. Um, this is a geometry of simple molecules and ions in which the central atom has one or more lone pairs. Okay. And it shows you some of these examples that we looked at. All in one sheet. Okay. Now, um, going on, all right. I'm going to skip over this, and um, I think we're almost to a point now. I want to try to make it about a third of the way through the chapter. We're all, you know, we're about there. Here it's discussing the concept of dipole moments and polar molecules. And um, two atoms that form a covalent bond, uh, based on their uh, difference in electronegativity, uh, electron density will be more predominant around the more electronegative atoms from the covalent bond. Here's the example of hydrogen fluoride. Fluorine is the most electronegative uh, main group element on the periodic table, and uh, so when it's bonded to something like hydrogen, it's going to hog those two electrons of that covalent bond. Then they're going to spend more time with the fluorine than with the hydrogen. And so in hydrogen fluoride, the fluorine is going to have a partial negative charge or character, the hydrogen partial positive. Okay? And um, a lot of what we call a dipole moment that's due to the result of this polarity in a molecule, it's not just the difference in electronegativity, but also the geometry of the molecule. Because uh, if, if a molecule is surrounded geometrically by covalent bonds that have polarity, they cancel each other out. And they make the resulting molecule not uh, much of a dipole and therefore not have a significant dipole moment. Um, here's showing you, and uh, this last slide will take a little break, but here's showing you the example of ammonia versus uh, nitrogen trifluoride. Since nitrogen trifluoride is more electronegative than nitrogen, the electrons in these covalent bonds spend more time um, with the fluorine it gives the nitrogen some partial positive character, which quasi-neutralizes the negative charge in this uh, non-bonded orbital. On the other hand, uh, when uh, ammonia, uh, nitrogen is more electronegative than hydrogen. And so the polarity of the nitrogen-hydrogen bonds reinforces the charge separation due to the non-bonded pair. To make a short story long here, <coughs> Or to summarize, ammonia has much more of a dipole moment than nitrogen trifluoride does. So a lot of it has to do with the atoms, of the um, atoms that are involved in the bonds, the geometry. Of the <coughs> this molecule has more polarity, which is uh, represented by its much larger dipole moment. It's almost um, almost six times the dipole moment of this molecule. Okay. All righty. Uh, I'm going to skip over this, and I think we'll take a little break here.
So um, yeah, so we're going to get started on hybridization now, um, uh, and um, let's take a break. Um, I think um, I think we can do the lab on Thursday, but I do have to sneak in there and make some sodium hydroxide. I brought from Beeville well, some potassium hydrogen phthalate. Each group is going to do a titration of sodium hydroxide with a measured portion of, of this to determine the concentration of the sodium hydroxide. And then after we do that, we'll each do a titration using the same sodium hydroxide uh, to analyze a sample of vinegar and determine its um, molarity. Um, vinegar has acetic acid as its acid. And as simple as titration is, they probably do them all the time, companies that manufacture products like vinegar. Except these days we have automatic titrators. And so um, the person doesn't have to stand there and do it. Um, you do have to get the samples. And, um, but um, there's electrodes that can discern when you reach the end point of a titration. And so there's um, automatic titrators, uh, but you do have to screw on the sample. And it'll print out, it'll store the data in the computer program. And you can do many of them and average it and all that. But we're gonna do the old fashioned way by hand. And so the way we'll know when the reaction is complete is the solution will go from clear to pink at the end point of the titration, and that's where we stop. Now, it has to stay pink for two or three minutes. As you get closer and closer to the end of the reaction, it'll get pink and then disappear. It'll get pink and disappear because it's being mixed all the time by magnetic stir. But when you add one more drop and it stays pink for two or three minutes, then you're done. Uh, but uh, again, we're going to do both titrations, I think, on Thursday, but i got to sneak over there and make the any range. So uh, let's take a five-minute break now, um, and then I'll talk a little bit about hybridization. We have to have another lab quiz. I didn't put it on the board. <laughs> That'll be next time. Um, and it'll be, we already did the one, didn't we, that involved, what did we do? The types of reactions. Yeah, we did the types of reactions. And so, and I haven't even graded that one yet. Um, but the next one is going to be over the magnesium oxidation and the very quiet again, except it's going to be much simpler, uh, simple little questions about it. And so, uh, uh, what's the date that I should have put that up there? So that, it'll be much shorter. Um, all right, um, any question on the valence uh, shell with on the parapulsion theory? The, not that, but are you going to cover the lab quiz? I haven't. Oh, which one? The one we did last time, the yes, balancing. I haven't. Um, you, you don't mean, oh, this one. Um, yeah. Well, I'm gonna, I haven't graded them yet, I'm sorry. but. Uh, I'm going to pass them back. You, you can keep lab quizzes. The only one you can't keep is that assessment one because I got to do a, a rubble report on it. And I haven't finished grading those either. I think I've graded part of it, right? Didn't I enter in? Um, didn't I enter in um, the blackboard? I, I think I used lab quiz number seven column for the assessment. Quiz, but uh, again, I have to hang on to them because I got to do this little report assessment thing. Uh, but um, I haven't finished these or the balance in the equations one either. Uh, as um, is there any question about anything? The, uh, also, don't forget about the um, the lab report. We haven't talked about that much. The first thing to do is just get on Microsoft Word and write each of those se sections. 
because you're going to have to say something under each one where you get points data. Put down abstract, you know, whatever. Um, do I have those with me? I don't know if I brought them or not. I forgot them. But um, when I gave you a handout of all the different sections you want on that, and we'll talk more about it as we, you know, maybe next week. But you don't want to put it off the last minute. And you're using the data sheet I gave you, which has perfect results, uh, not your results when we did one of those labs using the data sheet I gave you for that. In fact, you can even attach that data sheet to a, a report that you turn in. Is there any question about anything else? I mean, on this, these three things, we kind of covered the first one, so we got two more to do. Right, let's take a break for five minutes and we'll... Uh, and I think we'll probably, while I'm still around the lab, you could, I'm probably going to have you go to the computer room again. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
now we um, let's go ahead and just mention a little bit about uh, what we're going to be looking at next. Uh, and I'm going to give you one example, uh, but we're going to look at more examples on Thursday. And we talk about valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, and for all those molecules and ion, polyatomic ions, uh, really the concept is fairly straightforward. I mean, if you have a molecule or a polyatomic ion and it has one central atom, so to speak, uh, the um, the basis for the three-dimensional shapes, of course, is simply um, the negative charge of the electrons and the covalent bonds and the non-bonded pairs mutually repelling one another. Okay. So the uh, the concept is really fairly simple. Uh, but now we're going to talk uh, for just for a few minutes today, and then we're going to talk next time about uh, valence bond theory, and this has to do with um, um, how do we get there? How do we get to these shapes of molecules, other than the fact that they're repelling each other? Uh, what specifically seems to be happening uh, when molecules form uh, to the original atomic orbitals that we have if we have a single atom? Um, because when we learn about electronic configurations, the concept is somewhat silly in the sense that um, most of the elements on the periodic table don't exist as individual atoms in nature. Most of them uh, either bond to themselves or other atoms of other elements and compounds. And the question becomes, what exactly is ha happening to these atomic orbitals that we talked about when we learned the four quantum numbers, when we learned the shape of an S orbital, when we learned the shape of P orbitals, when we saw the shapes of D orbitals and so on. What's happening to those orbitals when molecules are formed? Um, and one of the theories is valence bond theory that looks at that. And I'm just going to show you one example today. And uh, since some of you may have to take a, a course in organic later, um, it might be useful to take, again, methane, which is the simplest carbon compound, and show you an example of valence bond theory and uh, hybridization of um, atomic orbitals. And if you recall, um, uh, carbon as a, an atom has um, six electrons. And its electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. So that's presumably where the electrons are if, by chance, you have a single atom of carbon. But, of course, where are you going to have a single atom of carbon out in space? And plus, I mean, if it encounters an atom of either itself or another element, uh, chances are that it's going to form a more stable arrangement and form some kind of a bond and make some kind of a molecule. Well, uh, if we write these orbitals and, and, and we recall the shape, if you actually uh, recall the shape, the 1s orbital, of course, is spherical. There's two electrons in it. The 2s orbital is spherical, but it has a larger radius. There's two electrons in that. And then there's a, a total of, uh, I got a real mess here. <laughs> there's three p orbitals, and there's an electron in two of them, and one of the p orbitals is empty. Well, now, obviously, I'm not going to draw any more um, stru uh, structures like that. Uh, we got a nightmare here. But if we write the uh, specific orbitals, that the electrons occupy. If we have a single carbon atom, there's two electrons of opposite spin in the 1s orbital. <coughs> there's two electrons of opposite spin in the 2s orbital. 
And then we just pick any two of these. They have the same energy, but by Hund's rule, we can't pair them, can we? So we'll just put one electron here and one electron here, and then that's p orbital is empty. Well, when uh, carbon forms four covalent bonds to other atoms, four single bonds, and this scenario is going to be different if carbon forms a double bond or a triple bond, but we're, we're just going to look at one example today carbon forming four single bonds. Now we know the structure in three dimensions is a tetrahedron, but we're concerned now with what happens to these orbitals. Well, first of all, this one is the same as helium, and it's, it's filled, isn't it? So it's, it is extremely stable, so um, the rationalization is it doesn't participate in the hybridization. But what is thought of happening when carbon forms four single bonds, and I don't know if I should use another color, but let me see if this has any ink in it. These, these are four orbitals total, aren't they? These four orbitals hybridize. And because the hybrid orbitals that they generate are the result of one s orbital and three p orbitals, we say that this is an sp3 hybridization. And so these four atomic orbitals, when carbon is in a molecule and has four covalent bonds, they all become equal energy orbitals. You start with four atomic orbitals, and you end up with four molecular ones, and these are all referred to as sp3 orbitals. They all have the same energy, and they all have one electron. So the scenario is different when the carbon is in a molecule and has four single bonds. Its electrons, its four electrons are in sp3 orbitals instead of the 2s and these three 2p orbitals. And also, none of these are empty. Okay? So you started with four atomic orbitals and you ended up with these four hybrid molecular orbitals. And you tell me, what's the geometry of sp3 hybrid orbitals? Well, what's the geometry of methane? You remember CH4? It's a, it's a, <laughs> what's that? It's a tetrahedron. It's a tetrahedron. Right? So that's the actual, this is what's thought of as the actual sh new shape. You saw the mess I had up here before. We had a carbon atom, I had an S orbital, one S orbital, a two S orbital, three two P orbitals. But now, and of course, the one S is filled, so we'll ignore it. And it doesn't participate in the hybridization. But all this stuff on top becomes these new hybrid orbitals. And again, they point to the corners of a tetrahedron, and each one has an electron in it. Each of these is an sp3 orbital. So we started with a 2s orbital and three 2p orbitals, and it hybridized into these three uh, sp3 orbitals. Well, another atom, like hydrogen can come along, and hydrogen only has a one electron and a 1s orbital, doesn't it? 
but it participates, it interacts with the electron in the 3s, uh, the, the sp3 orbital. And when you have a direct overlap of orbitals like this, chemists call this a sigma bond. That's head-on sigma. Okay. Well, there's going to be four sigma bonds in methane, isn't there? There's another hydrogen here with its electron in a 1s orbital. There's a hydrogen here with one electron in its 1s orbital. And there's a hydrogen back here with one electron in its 1s orbital. So we have a total of four sigma bonds. That's the only one we're going to look at today, but we have to think of some other possibilities because how does carbon hybridize if it has a double bond and two single bonds? How does it hybridize if it has a triple bond and a single bond? How does it hybridize if it has two double bonds, like in carbon dioxide? And I'm picking carbon as an example because some of you may have to take a class in organic chemistry and you'll see this again. But other nonmetals like nitrogen, oxygen can hybridize. And so can um, the smaller atomic number uh, nonmetals, or um, main group elements, I should say. Um, and their hybridization is going to be different involving fewer electrons elements like beryllium and boron. But the hybridization has to account for the uh, shape, uh, resulting shape of the molecules. Okay? And so this is uh, the hybridizations we're going to pick up next time. And uh, let me see who's in class. <coughs>